Even though the Big Bang is a theory accepted by most scientists, it's still based on models and mathematical formulas. So in a way, the Big Bang theory is a cultural model, and a theory, like a story, can be changed based on new knowledge. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective addressing important societal issues. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. In this episode, is the Big Bang just another origin story? Many cultures have ancient origin stories handed down for millennia. I personally have spent a lot of time arguing against young earth creationists who see the Bible as a science textbook. Many present-day scientists believe that our emerging understanding of our place in the cosmos means we can discard these primitive ideas as wrong-headed. Asking people to discard these cultural myths, however, is unnecessary and causes a perception of conflict between science and religion. Origin stories are rich in symbolism and meaning and can provide cultures with a shared purpose and identity. Can these myths coexist with a scientific cosmology as represented by the Big Bang Theory and discussed in my episode on Cool Stuff, Observational Cosmology? To explore this topic, I am joined in this episode by Dr. Janet Tullock. I met Janet Tullock several years ago when she showed up at a monthly meeting of the Ottawa chapter of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, probably around when I was serving as president. I was honestly a bit surprised to find a scholar of religious studies at an astronomy meeting, but we had an enjoyable conversation. It always feels like I'm bridging a divide when I speak with her, as we come from what seems to be diametrically opposite educational backgrounds. Over the years since she joined, we've had many interesting discussions, and I've always been fascinated by her viewpoints on the intersection between cultural worldview and science. Dr. Tullock is an adjunct research professor in the College of Humanities at Carleton University in Ottawa. She's a cultural historian with a PhD in religious studies. She's also a member of the Ottawa Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. She recently received two awards from Ottawa RESC, one for her writing about ancient religions and their connection to the night sky, and one for her interpretation of the night sky through visual art. Janet, welcome to The Rational View. Hi, Al. It's great to be here. So I've really been looking forward to this discussion. I think it challenges me to be open and accepting to non-scientific origin stories. Most scientists have, of course, encountered dogmatic evangelists spouting naive literalist interpretations of Genesis as replacements for science textbooks. As science has learned a lot about the history of the physical universe, could you tell me, in your own words, why we should remain open to myths and alternative origin stories? Well, I think that, like the Big Bang Theory, sacred origin stories have explanatory power. The Big Bang Theory certainly for our physical universe, but the sacred origin stories for cultural understandings of how the cosmos began. The latter here is tied into issues of individual and group identity, but I think both explanations are asking the same big questions. Who are we? Where did we come from? Are we alone in the universe? So there is a connection for me between the being Big Bang Theory and people's religious belief systems. What's important is this connection about our origins. Now, how people's belief systems interpret our origins goes from one extreme to the other, and as you know, rarely are scientific. But there's room, I think, for a popular understanding of both scientific and sacred cosmological views of the beginning of the universe, because they actually have a number of elements in common. Now, before we go into this, you sent me a glossary of terms before this, this podcast, and that was very helpful. Could you briefly describe the difference between cosmology and cosmogony uh, and even cosmography for our listeners? Sure. A cosmogony is essentially a narrative or a sacred story that describes how the universe came into being. 
It's also known as a creation narrative or an origin myth. Cosmology, a term religious studies shares with science, is an account of the universe as a meaningful entity in which there is some sort of underlying order or a structure that can be known or at least investigated. And a cosmography is essentially a description or picture of the universe in conceptual terms. So, for example, probably the most common cosmography that people in the Western world are familiar with is known as the three-decker universe, with heaven above, the earth in the middle, and hell below, which is essentially a very simplified description of the Christian model. As part of this, we wanted to discuss origin stories. So, so to you, what is an origin story? So an origin story is really how the world or the universe came into being. Scholars, as I said, call this a cosmogony. And there is also a specific type of cosmogony known as a theogony, which is a narrative that describes how a god or goddesses came into being. These stories are, interestingly enough, considered to have taken place outside of how we typically measure time. So, for example, religious studies scholars will refer to the process of creation as having taken place in ritual time, something that cannot be pinpointed to a specific day or year. It's just accepted that the event happened sometime in the ancient past. Interestingly enough, an origin story can be reanimated, that is, brought into our time through ritual practice in a worship setting. So do you see the Big Bang as an origin story? In a way, I do, yeah, um, in a loose sense, because there are a number of parallels with origin stories. For example, the fact that it is a cosmogony. It's a description of how the universe came into being. So it falls into the category of a creation narrative that defines the nature of things, relationships, order, chaos. The fact that the event occurred approximately 13.8 billion years ago, which poetically speaking could be referred to as occurring in the mists of time. And the fact that it began with a small singularity or what we might generically call, quote, a source. Even though the Big Bang is a theory accepted by most scientists, it is still based on models and mathematical formulas. So, in a way, the Big Bang theory is a cultural model, and a theory, like a story, can be changed based on new knowledge. That's definitely something that science does. I mean, and, you know, it changes with as we learn more. Um, I don't get the same feeling from other myths. Is that a differentiator from the scientific description of the physical world as opposed to the, the, the more religious, I guess, myths that they don't change? Actually, they change a lot. If you look at, say, ancient Greek myths, or if you look at indigenous origin stories, they change all the time depending on who the storyteller is or was. Where it is more written in stone is where one has sacred stories that are part of a sacred or religious text. For example, the Genesis story in the Hebrew Bible. There, you don't get any changes. Or with the Quran, one would not expect to find changes. Um, I understand there are a few Eastern traditions uh, that, with sacred texts that are theoretically open to changes in their origin stories because philosophically they are open to changes in their sacred texts. So by and large, religious traditions do not have fixed origin stories unless they are recorded into sacred texts, at which point the text becomes codified and it becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to change. So why is it important to discuss these origin stories? As I said earlier, for me, both the Big Bang Theory and sacred origin stories have a very powerful 
um, explanatory power. And the Big Bang theory is certainly appropriate for understanding our physical universe. Sacred origin stories, on the other hand, are really important for understanding cultural approaches to how societies view their beginnings, what gave them authority as a culture, and issues of group and individual identity. It comes back to this idea of connection and the need to know our origins, which science and religious traditions share, that goes beyond any mere literalist interpretation of a sacred text. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember when we were discussing this um, uh, earlier, and you mentioned to me that the scientific description of the origin of the universe, if it's all you need, has become a cultural origin story for your tribe. Yeah, meaning scientists of the world who are non-believers. Now, there are lots of scientists who are believers, or rather, I should say, there are some. But yes, I tend to think of it as scientific. It's a cultural story for scientists. Yeah, I mean, I guess it effectively repudiates the idea of the spiritual to, to be bathed only in the physical uh, realm. And that's difficult for some people to, to go to. Um, I go back to Richard Feynman on this one, you know, where... He said, uh, it's better to um, admit that you don't know something than to have beliefs that may be wrong. And that's a difficult thing for a lot of people, but for scientists, it's very comfortable because it's much more difficult for me to go and speculate where I don't have evidence. And that's just the way that a scientist approaches learning about the universe, I think. And for many other people, it's more of a subjective experience. I guess where I have a problem with science and religion is where there is a crossover of a belief system's origin story with a scientific theory. So, for example, taking the creation story in the book of Genesis literally. Or when science, as a discipline, attempts to expand its reach over the humanities, especially disciplines like philosophy or my own field, religious studies. And certainly there have been some so-called star astrophysicists who have done exactly that in popular astronomy magazines and books. And that just makes me want to tear my hair out. I think what is adding to the confusion with regard to this crossover problem between the explanatory power of both sacred origin stories and scientific theory is the recent discoveries that make that what makes up most of our universe is unseen. Dark matter and dark energy, as you know, make up almost 95% of our universe. Only 5% of the universe is visible. So all of a sudden, science, whose original mandate was to investigate and observe visible matter, is now moving into a realm that I think is very uncomfortable for a lot of believers or... If not uncomfortable, it's allowing them to question or lose track of scientific explanations of 95% of our universe. Well, it's certainly humbling uh, when you realize that, you know, we've really only got a great idea of, you know, 5% of, of the matter energy of the universe, but it's not that you know science isn't necessarily all about matter we're also about energy and um anything you know if you can find something find out something by inference it's still amenable to investigation through its effects on other things so it's not just speculation that this this stuff exists and now obviously our theories are incomplete and we're always learning and so it's not that you can say that we know for certain what this is obviously you know we would like to know more than just putting a moniker on on 95 percent of stuff and saying it's out there but we don't know exactly what makes it up <laughs> you know for some people you can see how they make the leap from ideas about dark matter and dark energy to sacred origin stories because there is such a gap in our scientific knowledge and people are looking for explanations what is this dark matter? What is this dark energy? So, 
you've brought some origin stories to discuss, and I have my one origin story to discuss. Maybe we should uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the Big Bang. Sounds good. So, in the Big Bang cosmology, uh, people have made observations of the universe, they've used telescopes, they've used our understanding of the laws of the universe. And looking around us, the universe appears boundless and expanding. Based on this observation, we know that it must have been denser in the past. And um, hotter and denser go together. Uh, and if you run the tape backwards, you get a, an age of the universe. And more distant galaxies, if we look through our telescopes, appear smaller. And we're looking back in time because we know light has a finite speed. So we can tell that in the distant past, the galaxies were smaller. And then they collided with each other and made larger and larger galaxies. And we arrive here at the present time with large spiral and elliptical galaxies. We can look back and we see quasars in the early galaxy. Uh, which are active galactic nuclei, which are theorized to be huge black holes that are swallowing up g clouds of gas and spewing out uh, jets at near the speed of light in both directions. And we can see these things echoing across the universe. Um, and if we play all this backwards to the earliest uh, time when the universe was a hot, dense plasma, we know the physics of hot, dense plasmas because we can make them in the lab. And we know uh, how, um, if we started out from very simple things, that uh, hydrogen would form and the hydrogen will fuse into helium because we know this is happening in the hearts of stars right now under high pressures in the same sort of conditions. And knowing nuclear physics, we can actually uh, predict the ratio of hydrogen to helium that we should expect in the whole universe based on our laws of physics and it matches what we see in the current universe the ratio of hydrogen to helium fits very well with our understanding of all of these things so we're pretty confident that all the way back to this first little time when the universe was much more compact that our laws of physics explain it very well um, and deuterium, for example, uh, is another thing. Um, if you look at the amount of matter that we understand, not including the dark matter, then there's not enough to produce the deuterium that we see in the current universe. There's not enough mass. And so the fact that we believe there's more mass in this dark matter is consistent with several different observations one being the current concentration of deuterium in the universe, two being the uh, rotation rate of galaxies that we can observe in the current universe. All of this suggests that there is some sort of non-interacting gravitational matter uh, that we have not yet discovered yet. Um, and so the story holds together very well. We can look back with radio telescopes and we can see we can detect the echoes of this original plasma and we can measure it in the noise of the radio telescopes and you can see it if if you have a a, a tv with rabbit ears on it some of that static that you if you turn between channels is from the explosion of the big bang itself so all of these things hold together for a, a consistent story basically we don't know what happened before this state because we can't look back further and all we can do is use particle accelerators to try to probe similar conditions to see what physics happens uh, and push back. But I think at this point, there's a limit on how far back we can go uh, with our understanding of science. Right now, we're limited, and we don't know what happened at the earliest times or how this came to be or why this came to be. That's not something that can be um, uh, investigated by science yet. And there's a lot of loose ends in science quantum theory relativity they don't mesh well together so many scientists think that when we come up with a theory that meshes these two things together we might have a better idea of what happened uh, but it's just not there yet so 
This is my story. I've told you mine. <laughs> Tell me yours. I have a question for you, Al. When I read about the Big Bang Theory, it always refers back to some sort of singularity. And I'm curious about what this actually is. Can you explain it? So a singularity is what scientists um, say is at the center of a black hole. Basically, if you have a dense enough bit of matter, if a, a star collapses and it's got enough mass, we know all the forces that can hold matter from collapsing. There are electromagnetic forces that hold atoms apart and electrons and protons are held apart. And when you get enough matter that pushes past that, it pushes the electrons into the nuclei and the electrons and protons neutralize and you get neutrons and you end up with a neutron star. And a neutron star is like a big atomic nucleus about the size of a city and it's all just neutrons and it's held apart it's held up by the nuclear the strong nuclear force and this is the strongest force that we know of in physics and this is you know it's what's behind nuclear uh, fission and fusion and this is what holds these new nu neutrons together but we know that if you get more than about two and a half solar masses in your neutron star it'll start overcoming the nuclear force and the whole thing will collapse. And we don't know of any other force that can stop it from collapsing into a single point. There are no other known forces of physics. So all that mass collapses to a point and you get a black hole. And the singularity is the point in the center of the black hole where all the mass exists. And so from the Big Bang, if you run it backwards, eventually you get to a density that exceeds what the nuclear forces can support and then you end up with a singularity now what that means i'm i'm not certain of either because no one can observe a singularity and a lot of people have the wrong idea of the big bang too a lot of people think it was like a a single dot uh, that exploded but in all of our theories even as the universe becomes more compact as you play it backwards it's still boundless and infinite in size what happens is that you go into relativity and basically the, the density of mass warps the fabric of space-time in such a way that, you know, perhaps it's closed and, and basically it's, it's like you're running around the surface of a, of a, of a sphere, effectively. So it, the surface of a sphere is boundless, right? There, there are no bounds, but it folds in on itself. And there are other geometries... Um, like you know a torus or something also can be boundless yet finite uh, but from our observations of the current universe we believe it's infinite because of the density of the universe and such it's not there doesn't seem to be enough matter to curve it in on itself so that it reconnects it seems to be flat or a flat euclidean space time and what this means is that it probably extends forever i have three origin stories I want to bring to your listeners' attention. The first is Hesiod's Theogony, which is probably one of the oldest texts we have of a recorded origin story. His origin story is actually a poem, similar to Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, and he uses the same type of poetic meter that Homer used. So we know from analyzing the text in these poems that they are redacted versions of earlier oral stories, just like the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible is a redacted version of earlier oral stories. And that is something that all three origin stories I want to talk about have in common. They begin as oral stories, you know, told around the fireplace, and there's always little inventions and changes depending on who is doing the telling. So Hesiod wrote two books that we know of that mentions gods and goddesses, but I'm only going to talk very briefly about the theogony. To go back to our earlier definitions, Hesiod collapses the story of a cosmogony within a theogony. In other words, everything that he talks about as being birthed 
he sees as a god or goddess. So when we get into the creation of planets and so on, he sees these as gods. His catalog of gods and goddesses consists of about 300 names made up of abstract con concepts like death or memory, but also physical things like the bright air and the idea of day. There, these two were also gods. So there's tremendous variety in what he means when Hesiod discusses the creation of gods and goddesses. But what I want to emphasize is that some of these divine beings actually had cults. That is, they had altars and priests assigned to them. They had worshipers. And so we think about, so when we think about uh, Greek origin stories, we really need to think in terms of Greek religion, not just myths. For the ancient Greeks, many of these stories, or at least the gods that appear in them, were real, and they worshipped them. They prayed to them, and there were feasts and rituals carried out in temples addressed to them. Historically, scholars used to think primarily of everything before the Christian era as mythology, and I think part of that is a leftover from how ingrained the Christian stories are in our culture and in our time. It's what Thomas King calls the thunder of Christian monologues. But keep in mind, if people still worshipped the Greek divine order, Hesiod's books would be sacred texts today and not just great works of literature. May I read you a little section of his Theogony? It's important to keep in mind as I'm reading that earth is a female god and starry heaven is a male god. So Hesiod speaks. First came the chasm and then broad breasted earth, secure seat forever of all the immortals who occupy the peak of snowy Olympus, the misty Tartara in a remote recess of the broad-pathed earth. And Eros, the most handsome among the immortal gods, dissolver of flesh, who overcomes the reason and purpose in the breasts of all gods and men. Out of the chasm came Erebos and dark night, and from night in turn came bright air and day, whom she bore in a shared intimacy with Erebos. Earth bore, first of all, one equal to herself, starry heaven so that he should cover her all about to be a secure seat forever for the blessed gods. And she bore the long mountains, pleasant haunts of the goddesses, the nymphs who dwell in the mountain glens, and she bore also the undraining sea and its furious swell, not in union of love. But then, bedded with heaven, she bore deep-swirling Oceanus. Chios and Krios and Hyperion and Ipetos, Thea and Rhea and Themis and Memory, Phoebe of Golden Diadem and lovely Tethlis. After them, the youngest was born, crooked schemer Kronos, most fearsome of children who loathed his lusty father. So we have a single female element birthing starry heaven and then mates with him along with other gods, to beget more divine beings, and so on and so forth. It's only after all of these 300 gods beget each other that you get mortal men who are born, and those mortal men then mate with goddesses to create children who look like gods, but are not gods. I wanted to talk about this particular cosmogony because it's an example of a creation story where creation only happens because of these supernatural beings begetting one another. They beget the planets, they beget the mountains and the rivers and the seas. Whereas when we talk about the creation story within the Hebrew book of Genesis, it's generally accepted that one begins with a divine entity who appears already on the scene. The creator is not begotten by anything. So that is a very different type of creation myth. 
There's evidence in other texts within the Hebrew Bible that earlier oral stories about the Israelites included the existence and worship of more than one God. But by the time Genesis is recorded, the worship of a single God who creates ex nihilo, which means out of nothing, seems to be the norm. So the main point here is that we are led to believe that there already is this single divine being who creates everything. Yeah, they all have the problem of the first mover. Exactly. And what I thought was interesting about the Genesis story is the order of how things are created. For example, on day one, earth is still unformed and is a void. Light and darkness are what is created. The sky is created on day two. It's referred to as a great expanse. On day three, we get earth or dry land and seas. On day four, we get the stars and vegetation and fruit trees. And there's really something interesting in the creation of the stars when one analyzes the text of Genesis 1 verse 14. In English, the text says that the stars are created for the purpose of marking the days and years. In other words, the stars are there to help humans track time. I think that when literalists look at the creation story in Genesis, they don't look at it very carefully because if the stars are there to help humans track time, yes, years and days and seasons and so on, but what could also be inferred is a kind of scientific view that it's only through being able to date stars how far they are away from us in light years that humans will discover a sense of time that goes back billions of years. Those who take the Genesis story literally are really, though, not interested in nuancing the text, of course. And then we get uh, other elements being created of the, in the sky, like the sun and the moon. Uh, they're created on day four bugs, birds, and sea monsters on day five, animals and creepy things, lions and bears, oh my, are also made on day five, and then on day six you get the creation of men and women. So it's similar to Hesiod's Hesiod's theogony in that human beings are made last. If you if you talk to um, the scientists um, who are trying to you know figure out about early early cosmology in in the in the physical sense a lot of them will say you know if you read uh, hawking's history of time and his thoughts on the matter was that basically without the universe without um space you can't have time right because how can you have a clock without space and matter So, I mean, time has no meaning. It's like asking, you know, asking what's before the Big Bang is like asking what's north of the North Pole. Isn't the answer the South Pole? (laughs) Okay, so the third story I want to quickly talk about is an indigenous creation story. And this is retold by Thomas King in his book, The Truth About Stories. I like this particular creation story because there is a single woman at the center of it. So many of our creation stories are male-centric, and even if there are female and male elements to begin with, the female element usually ends up getting the raw end of the stick. In Thomas King's version of a creation story, he talks about the beginning of imagination, not in the beginning there was a void. Of course, he's an author and Uh, writes literature, so perhaps we can understand why he talks about the beginning of the imagination, but still, I think it's an interesting difference. The world we know as Earth was nothing but water, while above the Earth, somewhere in outer space, was a large, more ancient world, and on that world was a woman. King assigns the woman the name Charm. She talks to all the animals, Uh, of her world, birds and fish and others, and they all give her advice. 
She's super hungry because she's pregnant, and she starts digging for something called red burn foot, foot to eat. A badger warns her not to dig too deep a hole. She tells him to mind his own business, and sure enough, she digs a hole straight through to the other side of her planet. She sticks her head in to see what's out there, but falls right through the hole into space and the sky. And so again, the sky takes on a very prominent role in this creation story. She's spinning and turning and floating through the vast expanse of space. She sees a small blue dot, and here I'm quoting, floating in the heavens, and she falls towards a very young earth that is all water. The water is full of fish, ducks, mammals, all of whom see charm careening towards them. The birds fly up, forming a net with their bodies, and they break her fall. As she can't swim very well or hold her breath for very long, uh, they need to find a place for her, and the only place that is large enough and flat enough to hold her is on the back of a turtle. Charm tells the animals that she needs some dry land to hold both her and her baby. So the animals all take turns diving to the bottom of the water in an attempt to bring back mud. They all fail, but the last to try is the otter, and the otter dives into the water, and nothing is seen of her until the fourth day. On the fourth day there shall be mud. Everyone thinks the otter has drowned, and they pull her body onto the back of the turtle. In her paw, however, is mud. She is still alive. She's just exhausted. Charm sets the lump of mud on the back of the turtle, and it begins to grow as they all sing and dance. The mud grows into a world part water and part mud, but now there's not room enough for everyone in the water, so some animals have to move onto the land. It ends up that Charm has twins, one light and one dark, and the twins create plains and mountains out of the mud, then forests and fruit trees, the seasons, sunshine, and finally women and then men. And all of them, all of the beings together, not a single creator, say this is as good as it gets, one big beautiful world. So this is, uh, and so in this uh, one, the, the, the world is on the back of a turtle. Yeah, it's known as the Turtle Island creation story. There are actually two stories combined here. The first is Sky Woman falling from the sky, and then the second is the Turtle Island origin story. Okay, that, that, that's a, definitely a different uh, origin story. Yeah, I mean, obviously it has a woman at the center of it, but what I like about it is this kind of co-creation that goes on. It's not a single all-powerful creator or even a pantheon of gods that are doing everything but still it is interesting that human beings are created last so i think that origin stories contribute to an understanding of order in the larger world or universe that can be known i mean not all of us have scientific minds like you al and while we can appreciate the theory of the Big Bang, in some ways it's no different from an origin story because we can't get our heads around the Big Bang theory. You gave a very clear, elaborate description of the Big Bang theory. I have a PhD and I'm having difficulty grasping all the different elements of the theory you discuss. And the thing is, in my case, I love to learn. I want to know. I work in the discipline of religious studies, but I am a historian. I'm interested in history and science and the scientific understanding of the universe. Ultimately, I think there are multiple approaches to knowledge, and I would like to see scientists as interested in some of these creation stories as I am in the Big Bang Theory. I find I find the origin stories are more about you know the purposes and and you know why are we here? It gives it gives a a society uh, a shared uh, background that helps them go forward and you know gives them a way to keep score, as it were. Whereas you know the scientific one is is maybe devoid in that area. It doesn't give you a value system. 
or if it if you do take a value system from it, you're probably doing the wrong thing. Right, right. It's interesting, though, how much a scientific theory and a story can have in common in terms of its ability for explanation, its ability to affect our lives and our understanding of our place in the world. The scientific theory of the Big Bang helps me understand my place in the world on a macroscopic level. But the origin stories of different cultures helps me understand my place in the world on a microscopic level. That is to say, on a human level. Yeah, stories are are, are part of our, our fabric. They're, they, they define part of the human experience. Yeah, profoundly. Anything that helps us understand who we are and where we come from, I think, is a profoundly useful exercise. Indeed. Well, this has been uh, fascinating to to discuss with you. Um, As always, I I, I learned some interesting things. Me too. So uh, I appreciate you coming to, to chat with me on The Rational View. Thanks for... Thanks for visiting. Well, thanks, Al. And I hope we do have a chance to chat again in the near future. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, please consider visiting my patron page and becoming a patron of this podcast at patron.podbean.com 